Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, adventurers, travelers, investors, entrepreneurs, and simply mind bogglers. Find all episodes of this show. Simply go to Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, or go to our website, judgmentcallpodcast.com. If you like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the airfare deals that you really want. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% in the airfare. Those include $150 round-trip tickets to Hawaii for many cities in the US, or $600 life led tickets in business class from the US to Asia, or $100 business class life led tickets from Africa round trip all the way to Asia. In case you didn't know, about half the world is open for business again and accepts travelers. Most of those countries are in South America, Africa and Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP or if that's too many letters for you, simply go to MTP, the number four, and the letter u.com to sign up for your 30-day free trial. All right, um, I'm here today with Desiree. Desiree is a YouTuber. She's a crypto enthusiast and she's an artist. And uh, Desiree has started um, with her videos while um, she was driving, actually. Um, they got immensely popular on YouTube. Uh, some of them touch very you know, sensitive and also complicated topics to an extent. Um, one that got really popular is Racing IQ, Fascinated and Horrified, which garnered 160,000 views on YouTube. Thanks for doing this, Desiree. Welcome to the Judge McCall podcast. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I, um, I actually forget that I started driving in the car. Like, I don't even remember that, but that is how I, how I started recording because that was the only place I like space that made sense because of where I was living at the time. Yeah, they looked, they, they, they looked very, um, to me, they looked like you had something on your mind that really needed to come out. And you were like, it could have, could have been anywhere. Like literally it could have been in the restaurant, right? You, but you had something that you, you wanted to, to talk about with the world. And, and obviously the world responded. That's quite amazing. That is exactly what happened. And it, it is amazing. I'm in the middle of, like, I won't say what, but writing an uh, application, um, like a personal statement for the application. And uh, this is basically what I say. Is it's like, I started doing this thing and the little did I know that like what I had to share my, my thoughts about would resonate with people. And like, I'd, I'm still doing it today. <laughs> like I'm still doing that. Not the same topics. Like I, I feel like my mind has like resolved a lot of the stuff that I'm guessing we're going to talk about a bit. But I'm still like talking to people and it, it is it is very cool that you know people want to 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 hear what you have to say and it's funny you mentioned that that video the race and IQ one got 160,000 views because I believe that YouTube like censors my channel um so it probably would have more if it weren't for that and um just Literally yesterday, I have a, a friend um, who was talking to me because I, you know, I'm moving from, well, I have moved now from WhatsApp to Signal because of the whole privacy thing. So I deleted my WhatsApp and uh, he was like, oh, it's nice to reconnect with you again. And then he was like, I've been unsubscribed from your YouTube like three times. <laughs> like, I've never unsubscribed. Why does that happen? And I was like, yeah, YouTube does that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to get into this. You know, it's been something I've been been monitoring um, over the last couple of years, and I started out with this podcast only last year. So it's it's quite a new environment for me, and I'm I'm hoping I can learn from you. And uh, one thing that that strikes me is that there seems to be these. Let's put it this way: we have we seem to have a lot of accounts on Twitter and YouTube that strangely. Um, Something strange is happening. Um, they are not being as maybe they are not being as uh, advertised as other accounts, and there is a lot of seemingly um, anecdotal evidence from accounts that just get uh, get get banned. And Donald Trump got banned, right? And if I talk to people here in San Francisco, they think I'm completely crazy, right? So most friends I have here, most locals say this this is just um, 
It does, it's not real, right? So if it happens, then it's just an anecdotal evidence. You you you're exaggerating, and uh, it just happens because people violate rules on Twitter. And then you listen uh, to Tim Pool, and he's been very vocal about this. He said, "Well, you know, these rules are made in a, in a pr- particular way that's very difficult for someone who doesn't have the same mindset to stay on that platform." And um, I noticed this, you know, we we have my videos, um, we had a couple of videos where we wanted to talk about COVID and they didn't, we couldn't get them monetized. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean we would have, they would have been banned, right? But it seems to be something strange is going on on social media. Um, do you feel, that, you said you're being banned and I, I read you being, well, we were being banned from PayPal. Do you feel... That is kind of an, like an evil superpower that these platforms have, or is that something that's kind of, it, it's a bit of randomness by the people who work there. Why do you think that happens? Um, and do you think that's something that will change over the near-term future? I don't think that it's an evil power. I, I think it's just what happens when it's just power. It's like these platforms are providing something very useful and they're doing it very well. So everyone kind of aggregates on them and they have like a network effect thing going on. So if you want to have your, if you want to participate in a lot of the discourse, I mean, I think that is going to change it. I guess that's the second part of the question. Um, You have to go to these platforms. So I don't necessarily think that that power has to be evil or defined as evil. It's just a power that exists and then it can be used uh, for evil. So do I think that these people are being evil? Yes, actually. But do I think that they're doing it purposefully? No. But I also don't think that it's random. So it's not random if it's caused by a very um, specific uh, trend, I guess, that you can point to. So you're in San Francisco and you're saying that people don't necessarily see what you're seeing in terms of the, the censorship or they're just saying, oh, people are violating the rules, so they're not seeing what Tim Pool is talking about in terms of it being the rules being subjective enough that they can be used how these platforms want to use them. And so like when I say that it's not random, it's not because people like, I'm guessing the people you're talking to in San Francisco and the people who work at these tech companies or run them, they have certain biases and I think they don't see how those rules are being applied inconsistently uh, because of the biases that they have. So I think that maybe they're not trying specifically to ban uh, people who don't agree with them, but they're going to because of their biases. And to me, that means that it's not random, even though like the actual individual actions that an, that an employee might be taking, um, they're not like trying to get that effect um, in terms of banning uh closing the circle of discourse to what seems appropriate to them, but that's what ends up happening. Oh, and then if it will change, uh, do I see this change in the future? I do. Um, I think that other platforms are going to grow because of this censorship. Uh, The way I think that censorship (laughs) works is that people end up eating their own so that the who is censored is just going to grow more and more and then people get frustrated and like people want to communicate and connect so they're going to build other platforms. Um, I'm a really, really big fan of um, Gab. Um, I mean, I'm really a fan of anyone who's building anything. I'm also a fan of Library. Um, other platforms I don't, I don't know as well or I don't use it as often because I'm not attracted to it so much, but those are two platforms that I think are there. Um, I think there's a bit of complication in terms of the, the masses being able to use these platforms, but it's like a adoption cycle. So you have the, the people who are there first and like that's happening now and that, that's just going to grow uh, over time. I think I saw recently that Gab said that they had like 200 million views, I think it was, um, which was similar to the the views of major media publications um, like the Atlantic and like uh, publications like that. And bigger than that, um, but I can't remember the, the exact ones. I don't want to say the wrong thing, even though you could probably guess. Um, so I, I think things are going to change. And uh, I did make um, a video recently where I was talking about Trump 
uh, being banned, which is like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny that this is just old news. No, like it's a really, 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 really big deal that the president of like the United States, because he was still the president at the time, got banned from a platform where there's breaking news that like occurs. This is where everybody goes. And that's he also, in a, in a certain way, I think built the platform. Not I would not at all give him like credit for it, but a lot of people flocked there since 2016 because of like the political climate. And like, I, you could say that that's a really bad thing. Like what he did, I think he's just an effect, not a cause. But, you know, like him being there, it definitely caused, uh, I, I think, a lot of girls on um <laughs> on Twitter. So uh, I think that they are accelerating their own decline. But it just won't seem like that right now. But people are going to get frustrated and they're going to build new things. And it's going to be like a slow cycle. I mean, I can't, uh, I can't like say for sure, but that's how like that, that adoption usually works. It's like when like, it's what happens, it was what's happening now with the WhatsApp signal thing, which I just mentioned, like signal has been around for years upon years. And then there's certain events that make people want to move. And then it's like, this just happened. There's like spikes and then spikes and then spikes. So I don't know if it's going to end up being Gab or library, something new might come up, but I definitely think that the landscape is going to change. And then there's, I think I'm talking a lot. And then there's going to be, um, a new uh, regulatory environment because they're not going to be able to, to censor these things in the same way. And then, well, we're just going to have to deal with that as in humanity when uh, we get there. Yeah, I think we are at an interesting cross part, crossroads right now. And, you know, I grew up um, on a in a country that fully subscribed to communism, right? I grew up in Eastern Germany, and I know that you grew up in Jamaica, and uh, Jamaica has flirted with some kind of communism over time. A lot of countries have. And, uh, I would call you it know, socialism, but I mean, sorry, one second. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I would call it in Jamaica socialism. Uh -huh. Yeah, they never went mainstream, or they never they never took over majority in in Jamaica, which is great. Well, what what I'm trying to get to is, you know, we had um, in 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 Eastern Europe and in. Uh, Soviet Union, you had these propaganda newspapers and they were obviously called, the biggest one was Pravda, it was called the truth, right? That's the word for truth and that was in, in, in Russia. And obviously it was the anti-truth, right? So everything you saw there was immediately being discounted as actually the opposite is true. Everyone knew that, right? No, nobody was allowed to say that, but everybody knew that. And then there was no use to, to read these stories. You would use it as a toilet paper, but not because you wanted to be derogatory, because we didn't have any toilet paper, right? So that was always the problem. And uh, there was really no, no content in there. And I think uh, this is what you just, just um, touched upon, is when you, when you create a platform, but you don't let the truth actually come out, then you, you start your own decline, right? So you, you become less and less relevant because the voices, you might have a certain consensus right now where you think this is the real truth, right? But this changes as we talk about things. Um, you know, on Twitter, things that are two days old, they basically have, people don't even remember them, right? They, they, they are not in their, their presence anymore. And what I think is, is the other side of this, and I think this is a death struggle for any platform that censors, but on the other hand, we have those, um, when I read that, uh, that headline today, um, since the UK GDP dropped so much, the Apple now has a bigger valuation, I mean, the company is worth more than the whole GDP of the, Uni of the United Kingdom, one year um, of all the outputs of people who live in the United Kingdom. So what I'm... What, what I think we have, and I, people don't really see this enough, we have this tech government that already is so big that the president of the United States, most of the institutions of the United States, they're not a match to the, to the tech government, right? So um, Google's um, influence, not just in, in popular opinion, but also in terms of sheer dollars, and the same is true for Apple, same is true for Netflix, Twitter, maybe to a smaller extent, it's ginormous. And I think... People haven't really fully realized how, how much of an impact these tech companies have, not just because we are on YouTube, but literally on everyone's and their opinion and how they live their life. Um, I feel like, you know, it just takes a couple more years and the tech governments literally just run the whole world. A couple of years, you said? A couple, how many years? Yeah, I feel like it's five, it's, it's five more years. And then, you know, then it's not just that we call it election manipulation. If Google simply decides who's going to be the president in every single country. We're not just talking about the U.S., we're talking about every single country. And I don't, there isn't so much, and I'm, I'm not even sure this is a bad thing, right? Um, so I don't, I don't want to put value on it, but it seems like a, 
like an odd process that there is so much power concentrated and it's easily used for political gains. Um, maybe they stay out of politics. I don't think so, right? Because sooner or later, your business becomes politically... Um, you Decisions on the ground can influence your, your business and you try to control politics. That's what I would do as an entrepreneur, right? So I, I try to go out to, 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 um, to public leaders, I try to lobby them, I try to influence them. But if I can't do this anymore, I put the pressure down a little harder. And I think we're going to see this, we're going to see this in m way more countries, and it's not just the United States. Um, I think that the tech companies uh, have a lot of power, but I think what it's not... Okay, so they only have a certain kind of power. Um, they have the power of, I guess, the written word. They control the flow of information, which arguable, arguably is the greatest power there is, is the, the power of ideas. Um, but they don't have um, militaristic power, which I think is another kind of power that, that is really important for them to enforce ideas. However, we are, I think, seeing the merger of um, the government um, in some ways uh, with... Uh, um, Social media. So what I mean by that specifically is the the politics of the people on I would say the left um, merging with the politics of the people who run these tech companies. So there's a there's that like informal merger going on. So they will support uh, candidates from um, some uh, particular political side. So I think that yes, right now I guess the tech companies um, have this power to decide. Uh, uh, who runs countries, but I don't think they, they're necessarily going, to ha necessarily going to have that if they don't also have like the, the, the political in terms of the machines of the states uh, behind them, if that, makes, if that makes any sense. No, I, 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 know, I know that's, I think we are definitely, well, we are, they are not fully, they haven't really used their, their monetary power, so to speak, right? So in the end, when you when you look back into history and you look into winners and losers of big wars, right, including the Second World War, the First World War, um, and uh, you know lots of other conflicts before that, you usually see that the the country with the biggest economic power, with the biggest ability to innovate, right, to to create new weapons, but also just to support their own supply lines, to support their own population during a crisis, during a time of war. This is usually the country that wins a war, even if in the outlook it looks terrible for that country. It looks like they're gonna lose. Um, say, tell say um, the the Israel's conflict, right? There, there seems to be they only have one hundredth of the army. Um, they they have literally nothing that that would indicate that they would win a war and they win most of their wars. And when when you have these big corporations literally going to war, right? Um, because there's so much money they produce, they produce so much value right now, and it is there is a real value, right? We pay them indirectly, but it seems free. But we give them our opinions, we give them a lot of data, we make we create content that they market. What what I feel is like, unless there's a big catalyst and things change quite a bit. We we have this a software is not just is literally eating the world in terms of political institutions in terms of political governments because they are the economic power right in the end they're going to decide which way we're going to go and there isn't so much we can do unless this trend eventually changes right and there's new companies coming around or we we're going to see a bigger explosion of say, say um, a foreign power like China right but besides this I think we're on this trajectory and we just have to wait it out. Yeah, that, that's a good point in terms of the, the money. Um, I, I guess we'll, we'll just find out. Yeah, they can just buy us, so to speak. I don't, I'm not even sure that's yeah. a bad thing because when you, when you think about from an, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you, you want to be where the money is, right? Or you want to be an investor. You want to be where the, where the money is flowing, where you're going to see a lot of future profits. Obviously, we, we sometimes hate mania. Some crypto might be one of those or not. I'm curious on your views there. Um, but you, you want to be where a lot of people expect future cash flows. And it seems like big tech is where people expect these, these big cash flows. We see this during the last you know, 12 months. Um, the market cap has gone up quite a bit. Yeah, I'm, um, I think I'm not understanding if you're asking me a question, like in terms of my opinion on something. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. What? 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 So this is kind of my, my overarching theory that we, we, are, we, are, we are having a battle on social media and in, in, uh, in the daily news, so to speak, that is a bit, it's not the real battle. So people look at the, the wrong um, plane of, of where the actual battle is being fought. So, and I know you, you, you're very vocal 
and you you express a lot of opinions most people are not allowed or not willing to express. Like you, you criticize BLM, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, something that's you know, basically not allowed in, in public discourse. Um, you, you are a strong proponent of crypto. Um, what, what I feel is like we, we, we have these, and I think you, you spoke about that before, we have these, these, these things that are being framed as problems right now, right, in political discourse that actually make no real difference. Maybe that's just me because I'm, I'm, I'm too, uh, I don't know, too spaced out in my ivory tower. But I think the real problem is somewhere else. And we do everything we can to entertain people. Right? We give them these topics so they can, can fight about them. But actually they make no difference because there's much bigger forces at play and nobody really wants to look at them. I don't know if we could change them, but nobody wants to look at them. But what are the bigger forces of, of play that you're uh, referring to? So one is the the technological progress, right? We 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 see this um, this is the singularity coming, you know, where Kurzweil's thesis. So we have this en- enormous amount of new technology coming online, and AI is now doubling every two months. So instead of eighteen months, where Kurzweil's thesis is, we double technology's power, um, processing power, storage power every eighteen months. In AI is now down to two months. So in the singularity, by this he describes this this ability to have something that kind of looks like artificial general intelligence. And this is, this, and, and you know, that goes back to social media. We, we have those, um, these algorithms, uh, algorithms out there, they can just change by whatever they, 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 uh, they distribute within the, in the social graph, so to speak. So we, we have this technology that's so cheap that, that kind of can resemble um, a mind of a human being. Um, and it can do a lot of tasks that a human being can do. And this is a major societal challenge. And I think it's a, it's a positive thing in the end. But, I mean, we are going through this impact. And we have this huge um, shift in economic um, economic power to a few tech companies, maybe a few dozen. Um, I mean, it's not just the fangs. And uh, those are on, a, on this trajectory will change the world. And I don't know, I feel like people, people are looking at this, but it's, people are not, they're not seeing that impact. Well, maybe that's just me and people know that already and say, okay, this is boring, I need some entertainment. And I, I, I heard you talk, and this is my question for you, you know, sometimes I feel like this race war that we have is just this, um, it's like an entertaining thing that, we, that people throw out there to just stir up some conflict and keep people busy. Ah, uh, I, I, I think what you just said made a lot of sense. Um, do I think that this race war stuff or race baiting or race craft, depending on what word, term you want to use, is there to distract people. So that major force you're talking about in terms of the, the technology growing really rapidly and power being shifted towards uh, tech, the, the people who run technology, I agree that um, that is occurring. I also agree that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't know. Okay, so I definitely think that people who... I don't know what the, per, what the percentage is of people who participate in these conversations about, uh, say, race, because they genuinely um, not even believe in them, but are, but are genuinely caught up in them. When I say genuinely believe in them, I mean, like, they could just be the, the vir- virtue signaling, um, but they're just caught up in that conversation versus the people who might be using it as a tool um, to manipulate the, the emotions of people and the interactions that people have with each other. Um, and yeah, it's not just race. It's 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 like it just seems like it's division all the way down. There's like between the, the sexes. Um, I guess that's the, the only other major one I would say, uh, as, along with race. I, I definitely feel like there's like this constant pumping of information out there that is meant to sow division and have people arguing. Uh, I agree that that is true, um, but I don't know uh, if it's if it's a plan from people who are higher up somewhere. Um, or if it's just this is what humans do because these are weaknesses that we have in terms of being tribalistic in these ways. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't know. But I definitely agree that the, the, force, is, the force of, uh, like, there's a background shift that's happening um, at the same time and that uh, people are more focused on the, the, like, race, tribalism stuff than 
that te- technological shift that's happening. Like I'm very aware of it and there are lots of people are very aware of it that I interact with, but like definitely the general population isn't thinking about it except like when like at a very surface level, like, oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin exists. Everyone's talking about it, like, you know, or AI or like as like buzzwords, but like not like deeply understanding. It's really tough for people, you know, those are complicated topics. And I mean, I, I, I have the sense that nobody wants to tell the truth. Like we just talked about this, this divide and conquer is certainly to it. And it's, it's gotten so cheap, let's put it this way. And propaganda has gotten so cheap. If you would pull it off, it's so much cheaper to do it now than say 20 years ago or 30 years ago. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist um, completely. Probably I am, but I don't want to be, I don't want to, I, well, it's, it's kind of, I, I would love to hear more about because you know a lot of conspiracy theories eventually turn out to be true, but some of them are just that, right? So it's just an, a thesis, just a just a term for for a thesis. If if you feel like um, this isn't, what do you think made the world so crazy? What do you feel? Why do we have this division, and why does it happen? In a relatively compressed time span, and I was was talking to Aaron a couple of podcasts ago, and we kind of traced it back to the Facebook algorithm change. That's kind of my gut feeling. You know, I don't know if you remember 2014, Facebook really went from we 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 give you access to we show you basically what you follow. Right, kind of like Twitter still operates to an extent, and um, like Instagram works, right? And then one day they decided, no, you can have a hundred million followers. Um, but they won't see your posts anymore. We only show them engage, engaging posts, right? But we decide what's engaging, not you. So Facebook, um, and I think that was well intended, tried to make it better content out of this ginormous amount of spam that they receive. And they said, okay, we give you only the stuff that's probably of interest to you. But in that turn, you know, they, they assumed the power of information. Um, and then suddenly everyone went crazy. And I think it was 2000, late 2014, uh, beginning of 2015, that was pre-Trump. And people really started to be extremely divisive. So we felt this is like kind of an algorithm. It's this big social experiment that we are in. And that was our best theory we come up with. I don't know, what, what do you think? What do you think is this, this theory? What is your theory why everyone went so crazy the last five years? Um, I definitely think that Humans are evolved to be interacting with each other in person. And so when we're having heated debates um, online, um, obviously uh, people get heated in in debate, have always gotten heated to the point of killing each other over ideas. Um, So part of me wonders if... uh, if it, if it can be said that people are more divisive, because maybe people have always been, um, but maybe the scale is greater now because it's happening online. Um, I, I guess I, I would agree that technology has uh, influenced human interaction Um, like with the the algorithms and stuff, and it plays off of, it plays on negative aspects of human nature because, you know, people respond really well to fair. And so, like, the way that media works in terms of what's engaging is going to be stuff that makes you, like, fair an enemy. Like, that's going to be the most you know, engaging stuff. There's also like puppies and kids. Those tend to be um, like really engaging as well. But um, but the but the I think the fair is a bit stronger. So um, yeah, I guess my theory would be kind of what you just said, and like the also the the thesis of well, the first half of it of um, the uh, that documentary, the social dilemma. Um, I, I think that it's just human nature being put in an environment that makes people focus on things that end up causing divisiveness and just that, because that's just how people are and what they, what they respond to. And so that's why people started going crazy. So like people who weren't your enemy um, eight years ago are like now the enemy because of like what seems engaging to people and then having those ideas put into your brain 
And also because it's all happening online. So it's like you're not arguing or debating with people. Um, like, you know, like you, you really, 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 really do not interact with someone online the way that you do in person. Like you won't say the same things to their face that, that you, you will in life. People just, <laughs> people just aren't like that. Like, because you can get punched in the face. Like that, that would happen. Like, <laughs> you, so like, you, there's a lot more sizing up of other things going on than just like the power of your words. Um, and when that's not there, um, and again, like in terms of the, the like fair based brain and what's engaging, that I think that causes people to uh, to go a bit a bit crazy. I know you didn't ask me this, but um, I'm not sure what the what the the solution uh, to that problem is. I don't know if people's brains will catch up. Um, I, uh, this is something I actually wanted to mention earlier when you're talking about the, the power that tech companies have and it not necessarily being bad. Uh, this is like kind of like uh, kind of from a meta level and it might sound super dismissive, but I do think that ultimately like what's really, really, really important um, is like like people's morals and like them deciding to to like be be better people <laughs> and I, I mean maybe that is very very naive but I don't really see how else it, how else it could change because if I'm looking online and I'm reading a post about how um I don't know Donald Trump is really really awful or um I don't know I haven't seen such a post in a long time <laughs> oh yeah yeah no, yeah well I'm I'm Mm-hmm. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I mean, yeah, I think we, we 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 all agree that kind of our limbic brain is constantly being manipulated. And I think it's wearing off a little now. Um, there was Donald Trump was a big driver for this and was COVID. Um, and there's a bunch of others that kind of come along. Um, the end of the world is near. And eventually you get tired of this. I mean, you can only be scared for so long, right? Then it needs to be at least a new topic to be scared or to be to be to address your limbic brain. So I think this is a good part. And I think I'm 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 very happy about that. I I I don't know if you 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 listen to Jordan Peterson, but he said, and he he talked about um, uh, Nazism in Germany, and obviously that's a big topic for me um, since I grew up there, and a lot of family is there. Um, one of the things he said from a psychological view to explain um, what happened in Germany is, he said that might be an outgrowth of empathy. So empathy is is we associated with we we feel like other people feel, right? So this is a good thing, right? So we we can we can. Um, put ourselves in someone else's mind and see how they see the world, and I think this is a wonderful thing. And w- how can empathy be be a negative thing? Well, w- what it does is it it kind of it does a black and white um, or can do a black and white association, so to speak, a negative positive. Who's going to be my in group and who's going to be my out group? And you you once you make this determination, and that's very much on an emotional level. Once you make this determination, there is no there's no nuance. There's there's nothing in between. You're literally fighting off people that that are just regular people, but for some reason you decided without talking to them, without interacting with them, it's kind of like the chimpanzee mother, right? Who goes out there and finds there's some other chimpanzees from another tribe. Um, you're going to kill them off, irrespective of, of what's actually going on. And he said that might be something that psychologists associate with empathy. So if empathy gets too big um, and is too much of a driver and doesn't doesn't get a little bit of rationalism and doesn't get any bit of neocortex thrown in, that's where he said, that's where Nazism started. And maybe we are, we're, we're, this is similar to the phase we are in yet, right, we are in right now, right? But we actually, we, we have this desire to destroy the other side. We, des- we destroy liberals, we destroy conservatives, we, we're on the wrong side of history. There's all these big, big words that, that people use to, instead of advancing a solution really, they are advancing, let's destroy the other side. And this is odd, right? Those are really smart people. They have high IQs and they are like, okay, all you do, like I see this with Ben Shapiro. Uh, he's a very smart person, but he, he his company, and I think that's, he has to build a show that makes money, right? It's all about destroying the other side. And I'm like, this is really odd. It shouldn't be like that. Yeah, I um, I totally agree with what you're saying. I, I want to query you. Um, I do listen or have listened to Jordan Peterson, but I don't know that particular uh, thing you were just talking about. <clears throat> How exactly, um, in terms of the specific context of uh, the rise of Nazism in, in Germany, did this, I guess, empathy for your in-group uh, turn into uh, wanting to destroy the out-group, if, if you don't mind, briefly? 
And I, I agreed with basically what you just said. Yeah, it's it's part of his psychology lectures. I actually like them the most. Um, they, um, I think he did a couple of them. He taped a couple of them. I think he has a 2015 and 2017 version of it. I only like I only listened to one of them. I don't really know, but. The other one, I think it's the prior one he did earlier. And it's kind of an offhand comment. It's not, it's maybe a 10 minute um, uh, part of that uh, psychology lecture that I like the most. I actually feel he, he, his early content is, is the one I could learn most from. For me, it's, it's the best um, that he did 2015, 2016. Um, I don't actually know why. Maybe become, he became more partial or become more in the limelight. I don't know what it is, but um, I could take the most value from those. Um, you, you've been very controversial with your um, criticism of BLM. Um, <laughs> no, this, the word controversial is isn't it, is by itself controversial. Um, how did you arrive there? Um, what do you like about BLM and what, what do you not like about it? Uh, no one has ever asked me what do I like about BLM. The only thing, like literally the only thing that I have found positive about BLM is the fact that um, people started uh, accounting for police, uh, deaths caused by police. So they started actually tracking that properly. That was because of BLM. That's like the only thing <laughs> that I'm like proud of that's been positive about them. The reason why, uh, the way that I came about having my opinion. Hmm? I, I think there's something, there's something really positive. Um, I think it's more circumstantial, though, is that it got people out of being isolated at home, right? It got them on the street in June or July, and some or some or many of those protests turned violent, but still, it got people out, and and you know there was a way to a sense of community that most people had simply had lost, right? And everyone was just stuck at home and hard locked down in a lot of states, like say California. Uh, we've been kind of like this for twelve months, and I thought that's a really positive thing. I haven't thought about that. But yeah, I feel like you could, yeah, I guess you could say that that is a positive thing. Um, I mean, yeah, you could say that. I actually have uh, uh, two friends, uh, two of my Jamaican friends uh, who are black, if that matters, who, who are in BLM protests, who are aware of my views of really, really not, not liking um, BLM. Um, they still talk to you? Yeah, and that's really important to note because I really think it makes a difference that they're Jamaican. So, like, uh, it, there is not the same kind of, like, I am going to excommunicate you from my life. Like, I, I don't get that sense in, um, I mean, I haven't lived there in a while, but, like, I don't get that sense from, from Jamaican people. Like, that people just aren't like that, you know, in the same way, um, even though they, you know... I might disagree with you. But uh, I wanted to explain the, the reason why I got my opinions... Um, from uh, about BLM was I, I heard about it um, and then I just did research. But that's it. I just like I went to their website. I looked at it. I, I there were things I didn't like. You know, their 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 focus on basically it was like intersectional feminism when like their cause was about um, men, <laughs> black men being like uh, murdered by cops. And there was like the whole kind of lie about the unarmed aspect and when it was usually that these people were criminals and like the police had a reason not to shoot them and then there's also the whole statistical significance where it's like it's like 1,000 uh, deaths overall and then like 15 or something actually unarmed uh, in terms of police uh, killing people um, and then there's, there's also the focus on only black lives so making it like police brutality a black issue when it's like I don't think it is um, <laughs> so it was just looking into it and being like, "This is this doesn't make any sense. I don't like it." That's 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 just how I got my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, th I think any rational observer um, on that would would probably share your opinion. Um, what what I found interesting to, and that's that's what what I what I'm trying to 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 discover myself. It, this became very popular, right? It became a became, I don't know how many people were on the streets, 20 million people maybe over the, the course of two months. So there was a lot of people who actually went through the trouble of going out there and we were scared about COVID, you know, that's the other hand of being out there in a, in a community. Um, this was an amazing um, outburst of public opinion and uh, public discontent. I feel there was a lot of discontent about the general economic situation in it too. And there's there's been way fewer opportunities in the last 20 years for young people. And obviously, well, it's spread out through through the whole population. What I felt is, it's 
if if you see this this public, and I think a lot of a lot of politicians saw it the same way. They said, "Whoa, this is really big. Um, I have to attach myself to it, right? I cannot be rational. Um, I, I give up being rational because I'm a politician. I'm basically a paid actor. I, I kind of have to accumulate what other people think, and then I have to replay it and make it sound great, right? They all just it it it. A few only a few politicians just kept being rational. I felt, and maybe that's that's their job. Um, but there was this this. It really resonated with society. Why do you think that is? So we we both agree probably that a lot of what's on their website, what's on the manifesto, right? Let's go, like, go. Let's go back to Karl Marx. It's a very left wing organization. It it just doesn't work in an economic sense, but it also is not a good incentive book for a wider population. Um, it, it works in certain areas, and certain communities can pull it off. But long term, usually these extreme left wing ideas are, let's say the word, problematic. Um, but why do you think it caught on so much? It was definitely a huge movement. Um, this, I guess the same reason left-wing causes always catch on. Like people, well, again, there's the, the discontent, but BLM was a movement but before um, the recent economic stuff. And just by the way, I, I think it's awful that uh, politicians like use uh, negative events in order to, as you said, like attach themselves to issues going on and it's like so many people are losing their jobs like businesses closing uh people dying family members usually older ones dying so people are not doing very well and then turning that amplifying like using political causes to like get people out there to to take out their feelings i i think that's not a great thing i, I wouldn't just blame it on the population like it's on the politicians it's also um the population like going along with it but that's a that's a tangent. I actually forgot your question. Sorry, <laughs> I started saying something else. No, no. I'm like, if 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 we all agree, and I think most people that are rational or try to be a little rational, right? They they forget their emotions for a moment. They would say, no, it, this is a little crazy. But irrespective, there were tons of people on the streets, and. Um, I, this is interesting, right? If you, I always think, and this is, relates to this um, a lot. I always feel like it's time for a new religion, and a lot of people say, "Oh, QAnon is a new religion," um, but maybe it's something new, a new cult, right? So I always felt like people are they, they're trying to find the sense of community in a, in, a, in a higher purpose, and this was really this is a shot in the arm with, with BLM, and you know, because there's other people out there. So I think what people are really looking for is this purpose and sense of community, and they don't get it in the sense or as much as they used to. Or maybe you know, in the 70s that happened too. A lot of cults just came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, in terms of why it was so uh, popular, it's like people need to find meaning in meaning in their lives. I think what I was initially going to say was was focused on the the left wing aspect of it in terms of um, you know people not liking um, inequality or like being envious of others. Um, but that's if you get into the like the black white thing in terms of like blaming like focusing on disparate outcomes, that aspect of the, the BLM stuff. Uh, but I, I also think, yeah, people are looking to attach, um, to find meaning in their lives. Um, yep, I agree with that. So there's a religious aspect. Yeah, and I, I, um, I don't know if you've traveled Africa. Um, I, I've been to pretty much most countries in Africa and I spent quite some time there. I always felt... Um, the 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 experience in Africa, um, in terms of we we have a lot of these neo-colonial ideas, right? So it's a very left-wing idea that basically whatever happened in Africa that didn't go well is basically the fault of the the colonial powers, and everything that worked is basically the the, the success of the locals. And before I went to Africa, I kind of felt this is the the majority opinion. This is the ninety percent of Africa. But when you go into, in a, in a, you know, I hang out in more entrepreneurial communities or when you go in an artist community, that isn't actually true. Most of Africa is very entrepreneurial, it's very forward-looking, extremely positive. And it, while those are some undercurrents in society, I think it's kind of like, this is, these are things you're not supposed to talk about, right? Um, obviously, when you go to another country, you're not supposed to talk about politics. That's kind of the first rule. Second one, don't talk about religion. I break them all the time and get in trouble. And... <laughs> And what, what I'm saying is, so Africa has a very a much more positive view on, on their own prospects than we would see it from the outside.
No, when you when you go to Africa, you feel the 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 economic prospects and the people how optimistic they are is is quite different than what you would expect seeing it from the outside, right? A lot of people say, well, this there's, there's a lot of very not successful economies, so this is a this very depressed continent, so to speak. A lot of countries are depressed, but that's the complete opposite experience once you're actually on the ground, and you you see this country to country obviously is very different, but in general this holds true, especially Eastern Africa and Western Africa, South Africa. Um, I did, that was really something that amazed me, and, and I felt this is the a bit of this is you know the economic freedom is 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 maybe not as big because you simply don't have access to as much money, but the social freedom, the way that the, the control you have over your own life is so much stronger than what you see in most European countries or what you see in the U.S. Um, do you think that's a that's a thesis to go on, or that's kind of nonsense? Uh, okay, well, first of all, I've never been to Africa. I would really like to go. Um, I've I guess had African friends, but I'm not close to them anymore, like in college. Um, I think it's something to go on. I'm not sure exactly what you meant by the last bit in terms of the, the social aspect, but I, uh, the, you, I think you said Europeans having um, less of social control. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you meant there, but um, in terms of the looking from the outside and then people being more optimistic, I totally agree. Like in Jamaica, which is not Africa, but I, I think I can make a comparison. It's a middle income developing country. The last time I looked, it was like 11,000 USD um, GDP per capita per year, uh, which is more than a lot of African countries, but it's still not a lot at all. <laughs> um, people are definitely happier <laughs> there. Um, and people are also very entrepreneurial there. And I, I think that what happens is... Uh, Intellect is very different from like actual experience. So people look at certain places and analyze them. Um, and just uh, FYI for the audience, I have uh, an article and a video that's um, about Jamaica's economy where I talk about this this idea, which I did learn in school in Jamaica, by the way, and have rejected since then. Um, the theory of mere colonialism and the same thing that you just said in terms of blaming everything on, like, the Jamaica was colonized by first the Spanish and then the British. Um, so there's, like, looking through the intellect, but that's very different from what people actually experience. So I agree with that part uh, of what you're saying, even though I've never been to Africa, but going from my experience elsewhere, I've also been, like, to Brazil and um, Nicaragua, and um, people are entrepreneurial, and they're just not worried about the same things in the same ways. Obviously, people care a lot about money, um, and like obviously, humans always care about status, but it's just it's it, it can't really be compared um, to you. You can't understand something from the outside. <laughs> you you actually can't. You have to experience it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I feel our economic well-being, we, it comes at the price of much higher anxiety um, that we have to go through every day. Um, and that's, I think, a sign of times we have those in, incredible leverage, but the individual responsibility to do the right thing, whatever that is, right in that moment, economically or morally, is the responsibility is shot up so much that it gives us crazy anxiety. And to release that, we go on Twitter and... Uh, I don't know, debunk someone. We really mean to someone. Sorry, I think, I think I helps. missed a joke. I think I missed a joke. A joke there. It gives a lot of anxiety. No, and what about Twitter? No, I feel like if you have this high level of anxiety, it's great to go on Twitter and just demean someone. We, we, we really mean right, on Twitter right. to someone. I think that helps you. Maybe, maybe that's how <laughs> these things are connected because anxiety is, is off the charts um, for most people. Yeah. And maybe understandably, understandably. Um, a lot, I know we don't have a ton of time left. I wanted to learn more about how you you take your political views and um, the views that you have on society, how do they inspire your art? Um, do you and a lot of artists, you know, they, they know a lot about religion. Um, they take a lot of inspiration from from the metaphysical and bring it into their art. How does that work for you? I actually think it's the other way around. So, okay, um, I I actually have been making art, even though I haven't been sharing it publicly for maybe like two years now, but. Uh, I think my openness and creativity in terms of my art really influences my politics because I'm very open to hearing different ideas and taking time to do research. And things don't offend me as much as other people, I think, because of like my, my personality um, in terms of like openness, which is really highly associated with um, creativity. Um, I, my art is never political. <laughs> I, that, there's nothing wrong with political art, but something that definitely... 
um, makes it difficult for me in terms of the, the professional art world. So not like actual in, individual people being interested in my art because that's always there. But if I wanted to like go to a program or something that they, they always make art very political, like you have to be making some statement, da, da, da. it can't just be about the aesthetics um, or even the spirituality. Um, you know, it's, it's like that... Uh, that Nobel laureate poet who who did the this read a poem for the inauguration thing. Um, I don't remember, I don't know her name. It's like that's what art is a lot of times, and I my art is not like that at all. It's it's usually personal. I usually never explain it. It's often something kind of spiritual or metaphysical, or it's focused on like aesthetics. Um, so I don't think that that my politics influence my art, but I do think that my art. Um, Influences my politics in a couple in two ways. One, what I just said in terms of being open, but also in terms of connecting connecting me with myself. Um, and so I don't know. I think that just influences everything you do in life. So yeah, when when we talk about breaking into and making a political statement that's necessary, I know it's really difficult for artists to to break into that into galleries into an avenue to sell their work. Um, it's and it seems to be almost impossible. Like I talked to a friend who, who works with a bunch of galleries in New York City and she, she basically said, you need to be at it for 20 years and just, you, I mean, there isn't much you can do. You're being discovered. So for, for you as, a, as an art entrepreneur, it can be very um, stressful to say the least, but almost impossible to get into that spot. And once you're there, you know, you sell, it's like, almost like LA, like Hollywood, but you sell for a couple million dollars your artwork because someone famous, um, a curator discovered you and you go to a bunch of museums and then suddenly you're worth a couple of millions. Um, as, as, an, as an artist and as an entrepreneur in that field, um, what are, what are, is there a middle ground where you can sell your art in between? Or is it really that difficult to basically make no money until you make a ton of money? <laughs> Well, um, I sell my art, um, but not a lot, but that's because I don't put more effort into it. Um, but I decided to not focus on it, which is why I said I'm not really doing it publicly anymore, but I get paid to do commissions for people because they, they like my art. Um, it's, uh, sometimes it's, it's mostly abstract stuff, um, but sometimes it's, it's portraits, um, actually people want to see my art a lot more than I, sh I share it and like want me to go in that direction. Like a lot of people, once they see my art, they're like, oh my God. But I distinctly don't want to go down that path of making it my career because at least right now, uh, or that's not true. I don't want to make it like something I have to live on because um, like I just don't want art to be that to me. So you mentioned earlier, I don't know if it was when, after we started talking, that I'm very much an artist. And I am in the sense that, like, my art is, like, very profound. And so, like, I almost don't want to sully it with, like, making it about making money and stuff. So I will sell my prints and I will do commissions for people who ask me for it. But, like, I'm never making art for other people. It's always, like, for myself. Well, if I'm not being paid, I'm, it's always for myself. Um... So there is a way uh, to make money, and it's the hard way. It's uh, you learn how to provide a service to people. Um, you have to learn customer service. You have to learn the, the details of, like, getting the materials, like, shipping it to, to customers. Um, I mean, like, I actually, <laughs> this is the last one I'm going to do for a while. I, I just turned it off. I just said I'm no longer accepting any commissions. But I'm doing this made-to-order painting that's like, uh, I use this company called Genie Canvas. That's absolutely amazing because they make it so that you can, they call, they have these things called collapsible canvases. Um, so it's like it folds and rolls. And so you can ship really, really large artwork uh, that way. But it uses like Velcro. So the way, the reason that I'm saying this is because this is like what people actually want, like ordinary people, like for their homes to decorate it. But I feel like that wouldn't fly in a gallery just because it's like, it's not like cultured <laughs> to have like a collapsible canvas that like has Velcro on the back. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it's a very different world. So you can be making art for like regular people if you want. Um, and it's just like any other business. 
that I guess that's that's what I'm saying. And I mean, like these are due for a few hundred dollars. Um, so it's not the same thing as like selling for a few thousand dollars in our, I mean, way more than that with a gallery. I do have some pieces um, that are, again, this is this is personal pieces. So like I'm not selling those unless it's like 5,000, 7,000 or something. They're not on sale, but if I ever sell them, they're going to start at some price really high like that. But that is different from the, the, the art that I make for like people. That's I mean, they could always buy a print of the other stuff, but. Yeah, I, I hope that answered your, your question. <laughs> it does, it does. And, you know, this market certainly doesn't get as much attention. I feel this is uh, kind of undervalued. People say, oh, you have to go to Vietnam to find people who, who make art for you. Um, and, you know, that's often more a perception problem. Um, it, it is, I think, a market like where you, you literally know what you want and someone just copies it, but that's kind of boring. And uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, uh, you probably have accepted Bitcoin in 2017 for your first artwork, and now you're, you're really rich. I know I you're a big not. proponent of. <laughs> <laughs> Most you're a big don't proponent know of Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Probably, well, a lot of people <laughs> accepted Bitcoin by accident. I actually had a friend who was really into the early trading with Mt. Gox. I don't know you remember that, um, and he lost a lot of money in 2013. I actually wasn't around probably, then, but I do know of Mt. Gox, but I wasn't there like, so, at that time. So he literally had five thousand dollars invested in Bitcoin. Half of that what went, went away, right, with Mt. Gox. But the other two and a half thousand are now worth enough money to live on. So he's a big fan of Bitcoin, mm. obviously. Uh, mm. <laughs> so, how did you get into Bitcoin? It's just because you like it for, as, a, as, a, as a libertarian project and you're independent of, of what's going on in DC and, and the, all the other money printing. Or, how, how, do, how did you find your connection? Well, I just heard about it on a podcast and then I bought some. Well, I bought one, but then I sold it. Um, I bought it when it was like $200, $300, but I sold it uh, for to pay my rent when I was in college. Um, and, and then I didn't get back into it again until, um, like early, mid 2017. So I haven't been around that long. I mean, I've known about it before a lot of people, but I haven't like reinvested in it that long. Um, and then I was working with a, a crypto, crypto company. So I've been paid in, in crypto. Um, and I've definitely been in that world. Like I've gone to conferences, and I really understand it pretty deeply. Um, I have a website where I explain like the, the mechanics of, of blockchain. Um, I definitely like the decentralized aspects, the people being able to use a money supply that has integrity and that's not just being manipulated by the government and where they, they can like safely store value, the value of like their hard-earned money. I, I definitely like that aspect. I also have a bit of a cypherpunk <laughs> mindset in terms of um, creating technology uh, in order to have social change in the world versus relying on laws. Um, so I'm I am a bit edgy <laughs> in that way. Like I think that's important. Um, I do I don't know if Bitcoin itself is always going to have that aspect because it, it is like transparent, like you, it's not private, which I think is really important. But I think it's a good start. And just simply in terms of in the integrity of the money supply and it not being inflated whenever the government feels like it, like that's, that's very, very uh, important. Oh, yeah, I totally see the attraction to it. I always feel like the, the promise that it's going to be a restricted money supply a lot of other coins have gone the other way, right? They came out with this and said, okay, this is the total amount of coins, and then they suddenly changed their opinion. I know the Bitcoin community has been more strict, but I feel like this could change tomorrow. So I'm always a little doubtful. That doesn't mean I'm, I, I still, I'm still invested in Bitcoin, but I always feel like this could change tomorrow, and then um, someone could come along and say, oh, Bitcoin X is weird. It's not a good idea anyways. It's only criminals. And uh, by the way, if you have Bitcoin, you, you make your, your, that's illegal, right? It's a crime. And this could happen overnight. So I always feel this huge, um, huge ways for the government, if they really would have trouble with Bitcoin, to just get rid of Bitcoin in a heartbeat. And nobody can do much about it. I mean, you, um, we can all move to the Ukraine or Russia, but I don't know if that's such a great option. I actually don't think they can. And I, I don't think they can even more, yeah, even more than I used to. First of all, they could make it fringe, but they can't get rid of it. So I used to think that. But now, like with what's been happening this year, with like PayPal adopting this and like Elon Musk and all that stuff, like I don't even think they, they could make it fringe now. So I, I don't think they, they could 
get rid of it. In terms of the like developers deciding um, to make it um, change the the rules of the technology in terms of it stopping at 21 million uh, Bitcoin um, and having a fixed supply. I think it's not likely, but I, I guess it's possible. But because it's it's open source, like it is developed open source, like there's a Lightning Network, which is not, that's a whole debate about how it's, you know, controlled by a private corporation. But Bitcoin itself, um, I think it's not likely because of its open source nature that it, it would end up being turned into like another government fiat money in terms of controlling the, the supply, inflation to supply in that way. But yeah, I guess it is yeah. it's, it's kind of possible for developers to do that. So when, when you said that earlier, that you think laws and policies don't matter as much, right? Um, well, what do you mean by that? I had this, this thesis just as an intro for you. <laughs> Uh, before, before you before you get to answer, and this is well, I always get get trouble for my long intros. But I had this thesis with with Heidi Abuzo, and she was she is a really an expert on the Middle East. And I said, you know, really the policies, the individual policies of who we're gonna like in the Middle East, who we don't like, and that changes every four years, anyways. Uh, you know, these policies make no no big impact. If we if we put someone on the embargo list, they just trade with Russia. If we don't give them money, they get the much they get the money from China. So the actual policies don't matter so much, and Things are they're on a different trajectory. You don't have to worry so much about it. She was very vocal about it. What do you, do you? Is that something similar that you think, or you have a very different approach to that? To, the, to how laws shape something? Yeah, I think laws. I wouldn't say they don't matter at all, but I, I do agree. Like I was talking about the the cypherpunk thing in terms of you can create te technology um, that is uh, outside of the law, which is actually what I think is happening with the tech companies, which is what we are talking about uh, earlier. So the technology can um, provide power that the law might not provide, like not want to give, but like, like the technology or the people who run the technology have it anyway. Um, so I, I think it's a matter of degree. Um, so uh, for example, there's uh, the facial recognition technology, which I don't like, but the, the guy who, I forget his name, uh, I think it was Clearview Technologies, I can't remember, who started it, he, has, he was recorded in, a, recorded in an interview saying that this was going to happen anyway. <laughs> this technology is going to be made anyway, why not make it? Um, and so... The government has some ability to not use it. I mean, it's supposed to the government that is using it, like police agencies or, you know, cameras on the streets or something. So there are cases where the government has some degree of control over how much that technology can be used, but it depends on the technology. So that works a bit more with something that's public, where you can like possibly, I mean, they probably, maybe they'll make cameras really, really small so people can't tell, but you can see when like a camera is being used. That's different from someone running a node for a cryptocurrency in their, their home. So police would have to like be raiding people's houses, which yes, that can happen, but it's like harder to keep, to keep track of. So I think, I don't really know, like technology depends on the technology, whether or not it can be controlled by, by laws. Yeah, my my favorite example is, and uh, it's obviously not universal. I understand that, but think about the what happened in Eastern Europe, literally out of nowhere and with full government control of the media. It was hundred percent controlled. The government controlled elections. Government controlled economy. Uh, literally, when you go to the gas station, it was controlled. There was there was no restaurants, for instance. Like the, everything was controlled by the government for a particular reason. They wanted to make sure you work in your most productive way, from their point of view, in a more most Leninist way. But then overnight. Literally in a country of 17 million of Eastern Germany, 13 million were on the street and said, okay, we have to get rid of this. And that happened. And then two weeks later, it was gone. And that was the end of story, right? So things can shift a lot if people get make up their mind and are on the right side of history. I don't know if I should use, <laughs> I should, I should use this. <laughs> but... Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to say with the policies, right? So you, you can nudge around, and I think you, you're expressing something similar. There is the... the you can nudge around the edges a little bit, and we we what eventually only restricts us is what creates a long term survival edge, and that's when we go back to the Old Testament, right? So it created a long term survival edge, I assume, because the culture is still around, right? And we adopted it now in Christianity and in Islam, uh, a lot of it. 
if the actual policies that you make, we don't have to argue too much about it because these things will work themselves out anyways and the right solution will be made. Even the Soviet Union eventually fell apart, right? And that was, again, one of Jordan Peterson's big themes. He said, you know, is there something really about the Soviet Union? And he started his research in the early 80s that we feel, not just from an ideological viewpoint, but from a you know, core humanity viewpoint is something that will fall apart. And, you know, he was right. And the Soviet Union was wrong because <clears throat> when you sit on the other side of that, right, you sit in the Soviet Union and you, you have a very different re- viewpoint of the world and you're like, well, the next law really matters, right? But it didn't. Well, what mattered was um, big forces that were really, um, had nothing to do with what people actually talked about most of the time. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, that, that had to do with, you know, like, like you said, people made up their minds. So there's like a cultural thing and like what what people as a collective uh, end up deciding. Yeah. So the collective is always right. Do, would you agree with that statement? Uh, uh, no. Nope. I would not. <laughs> <laughs> I would not agree with that statement. Right? Nope. But they do have power. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to let people know that I'm doing a series on um, the Gulag Archipelago. Uh, due to having heard Jordan Peterson mention it years ago and then finally having gotten around to it. And I go through uh, just each chapter uh, of each volume. And I'm about halfway right now. Yeah, how did you like it so far? I, re- I really like it and it's depressing. I think that's a, it's, a, it's very insightful. It's, it's definitely worth, worth uh, the read. It's one of the best books I've ever read, and it it drowns you in all these historical details. And I I, I was many times I kind of gave up, and I said I can't read anymore because there's so many, you know, edicts and changes, and especially the first part. And I'm like, is this, is, how is this relevant? But he, the point he's making, right? He's just convincing you, and that was the whole point that that it really happened. He didn't just make it up. So he had went down into every little notch and detail, and then I think he has this enormous insight. I don't know how he got there. You know, he started out as a very convinced socialist, <clears throat> Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and then he created these these incredible psychological insights just by being in prison. So, and, and that's one argument. Um, I don't know if you agree with this. That's a little, maybe a little too abstract, but I always feel a little bit of oppression is actually a good thing because it kind of forces you to. Uh, you don't want to be killed on the spot. That's obviously a problem. You know, as a, as a as a group or as an individual, that's a big problem. But a little bit of oppression is good because. It's kind of what forces you to to you know focus on the things that really matter and that give you an edge against everyone else. So I think we're all oppressed by nature, but some people are more oppressed than others, and we oppress ourselves. You know, compared we are oppressed to people that we we don't like, people that we don't know. But maybe a little bit of oppression is actually good because I feel Alexander Solzhenitsyn wouldn't be such a great author and 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 uh, individual if he wouldn't have been in prison. Yeah, that's funny because I. I... Um, in this thing that I am writing, I I picked out a quote from the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, where he was talking specifically about that and about Russian literature and how for the first time because of the Gulag camp, Gulag camp system, the people who had the knowledge, like education to write, could actually experience and understand like all the strata of society were together versus them being apart. So they could actually write about each other without either being like too envious or as in if you're the, the lower um, writing about the upper or um, actually understanding the experience if you're like the upper trying to write about the lower. Um, and it was just like, oh, that's the only way you can actually produce good art. And when there's both actual understanding and then the skill set and the, the time uh, to, to write about it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky book to read. And well, what... what I realized is that he had so much more insight into social life. It's very hard to find that even, you know, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, um, he, he describes it in a, in a, in a non-prose, um, um, in a non-fictional uh, um, setting. And I really, I've, I, I can't make up my mind how he got there, right? He seems such, like a, such an average person in the beginning. And he, he comes to this greatness of, of deeper insight into psychology, into economics, that you wouldn't associate with someone who just was in prison, right? So his, his personal growth is, is stunning. I think it's, it's one in a generation. Yeah. Um, do you, still, you still have a couple of minutes left? How, how busy are you? I was going to say, I was going to mention the time, but I, I didn't <laughs> want to mention it. So I, mean, I, I would right. like a, to, to end. Like, no, if, if there's I one I, more I'm, thing... 
And you have to answer very quickly. Oh, I wanted to ask you about Amazon Prime. How did you make that happen? I saw you were on Amazon Prime for a while. Which one, the JTOL or the or, or Crypto Ramble, the crypto stuff? Or uh, I yeah, just thinking out loud. I think that's the one I saw because they don't accept anyone anymore, from what I what I've seen. Oh, they don't? Are you sure? I think they just have that's a lot of they, rules. <laughs> I don't know. If they, yeah. they you just have to put a lot of effort into your into the content, which is I mean, like I might continue doing it because I'm trying to get help now, so I can probably find the time. But I stopped because I just couldn't find the time <laughs> to do it. But I stopped other things too, not just that. Um, I just uh, followed their instructions. And I think the the website is like Amazon Video Central or something. I can't remember the exact term. Um, and it, the the thing that makes it difficult is that you have to have subtitles. And you have to, you can't have like any subscribe or anything in there. You have to remove any watermark. So they, they, I'm sure they put these, um, Amazon, I'm sure thinks very, very carefully about its, its products. So they do that to create a barrier of entry. Um, but uh, I mean, they, they have some informal stuff on there. So I didn't think my content was out of place. It's just that it, it takes uh, a lot of uh, work. Yeah, 2018, they stopped accepting any, anything that looks like a podcast or a vlog. So uh, maybe it just got under the wire or maybe they just, as you say, they just want to um, reduce the expectation a little. But they do that already, but it's just that you have to take out anything that makes it sound like that. So, for example, oh, I don't okay. say anything, up, you can't say anything about, I can't I take out anything that says follow me or check out this video, like, but that's just in their rules. I'm not sure, I actually don't remember when exactly yeah. I was uploading that stuff, but I, I mean, I didn't get any email that's like, you know, you can't do anything anymore. Because I've seen, because they have documentary series where it's just people, like, with their cameras that that are, like, yeah. you know, like, they're doing hunting or something like that. Um, so I don't know exactly. I'm not sure if it's not any vlog or if it's just, like, the format that you do it in. I don't know if they've changed that, but it was yeah. just, like, you had to just cut out certain things that made it, like, obviously, like, internet vlog kind okay. of thing. That's yeah. good news. I'll check that again. But they were really anti nonfiction. So anything that's not that's nonfiction, they were not they, they gave you like fifteen disclaimers or say we won't accept it. So I kinda gave up. Maybe that's just what they wanted. Or maybe it changed since I, I was looking at it. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well that's good yeah. news. I'll I'll try again. That seems like a great avenue. Yeah, I mean I wanna do it again. I I don't expect to get any views there for a while and then eventually I might get banned. I don't know. But I'm only gonna do major stuff. So I might do like the gulag thing. Like the the series that are like really well researched and not so much just me commenting on on um, recent events. That's what I'm thinking. I might get back to it maybe. Okay. Thanks for doing this, Desiree. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. I I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, so I don't want to say it wrong. But thank you. <laughs> yeah, give give it give it your best shot. <laughs> Torsten. Yes, you got it. Yes, it's uh, originally it's uh, from the uh, the North mythology, right? It's Thor, but then it got a different uh, um, ending in German. They kind of like that more. I don't know why. Uh, That's that the short history sense. of it. Yeah, so I have uh, some North Norse mythology and uh, the Jewish last name. That's my personal. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Desert, thanks for taking the time. We do make some cuts, but it, you know, ninety nine percent of the conversation will survive it, hopefully. Okay, um, so I just want to let people know um, that they can find me uh, at justthinkingoutloud.tv and my YouTube at just think, at youtube.com slash justthinkingoutloud. Basically, just search for that. I'm also on Twitter, and I'm on Gab, um, and I'm on Library, and on Minds, and that's it. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. You too. Bye.